service of worship today, so welcome to Greendale People's Church today. May the Lord be with you. The uh, announcements that we have, once again, we need scripture readers. Uh, after today's scripture reading, uh, you may have uh, second thoughts if you're thinking about it, because there are some difficult to pronounce names in the first in the first scripture reading, so we're going to be good sports to uh, Sherry when she reads. We've all, we've gone over this a couple times, so Sherry, we're all on your side. And if anybody else would like to be a scripture reader uh, in weeks ahead, contact Bill Hackett for this service, Nancy Samato for the early service, 8:30. Office volunteers needed. Uh, you could be the friendly face of our office. Imagine what a high calling that is. Uh, even behind a mask, we're all friendly, but this is your opportunity to put it to good use by volunteering in the office. We are looking for volunteers on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Karen comes in on Mondays, and Marion comes in on Tuesdays, and so you'd be in good company being an office volunteer. You can read the bulletin. For more information, the bulletin is available online. Or contact the office. Give us a call tomorrow morning. Altar flowers. You, you may honor, remember, or celebrate loved ones, friends, or special events by ordering altar flowers. You see we have some beautiful ones for today. There's a sign-up sheet next to Fisher Hall. If you don't know where Fisher Hall is, it is the area beneath where we are now, uh, downstairs. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet there, or you can email or call the office with the date and special instructions about those flowers. Very good. Well, uh, <laughs> we're just about ready for you, Annie. Uh, this is Pentecost Sunday in the church year. Um, other holidays of the year get a lot more attention. Christmas, Easter, Good Friday, uh, and the like. But uh, Pentecost is our celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that brings us power, that unites us, that gives us a sense of purpose and what we're doing, the confidence to go about our Christian lives as individuals and as a church community. So this is big stuff today. Um, in particular, during the sermon today, I will make mention of the fact that this is not, the arrival of the Holy Spirit is not this kind of nebulous spirituality that people talk about today. It is the Spirit of the Lord. And we'll talk about the name of the Lord during this service today. For it is the Lord that sends the Spirit, and the Lord is with us in all things. Um, one of the benefits you have at coming at 10 o'clock is uh, I preach a, ser a sermon at 8.30, and I arrived to that service today with about a one hour and 20 minute sermon that I had to cut way down. So you will not have to endure that, so I might be making it up as I go along. But I'm enthusiastic about this, so I came with a lot of material. Um, this, is, this is near and dear to my heart, and I trust by the end of the service it will be for you as well. The color on Pentecost is red, and that is why I'm wearing red. I see Ellen has red, and Karen as well. Kim has it back there. It's the color of Pentecost. It's a special day, so let's in the power of the Holy Spirit enter into worship as Annie prepares us with the prelude today. Thank you. 
Almighty and everlasting God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts this day by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that here this day in this place we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The name of the Lord will be certainly a feature of this service today. The scripture reading that Sherry is about to read has as its last sentence, it is the bottom line, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God takes God's name seriously, the Lord. Um, I have this practice if I go someplace and I'm going to split a bill with the person that I'm dining with or having coffee with, I try to put in a little more money than the other person. And my wife asks me every once in a while, why do you do that? And I say, because my reputation is important to me. My name matters. I would rather be known as someone a little too generous than a little too cheap. <laughs> my name matters, in other words. And we will see in our scripture reading for today, the name of God matters to the Lord. The bottom line in this first, after all kinds of stuff is, calling on the name of the Lord results in one being saved. Sherry will read that for us now. From Acts um, 2, 1 to 21, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house while they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be the tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of those who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Somehow made fun of them and said they have too much wine. Peter addresses the crowd, then Peter stood up with 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and bellows of smoke, the sun will turn into darkness and the moon to blood. Before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. <laughs>
My step counter said I put 2,000 steps on during my sermon at 8.30. Wow. Uh, why don't you put a step on your step counter by standing and without doing touching, but greet those people around you with the peace of Christ. <laughs> I'm pleased to report I, I spotted no grouches out there in the congregation today. A sweet spirit in this place. Let's pray. Gracious God, you brought us together on this beautiful morning. Uh, first indications of the coming summer. The cold, dark days of winter are behind. During some of those days, um, the sun seldom was shining. The darkness sometimes seemed imposing. The restrictions of the pandemic limited our lives and our relationships. The cold prevented us from coming out. And for some, it was as if they were in a valley. But you are the Lord in the valley as you are on the peak of the mountain. The name Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord is the one who is with people in their distress and you've been faithful to us and for that we are grateful there are some people who are experiencing moments in the valley for a variety of reasons they could be financial they could be medical relational physical spiritual psychological and on and on Lord, uh, you are the sufficient one. You are the one who is with us. We call upon your name, the name of the Lord, out of the pit, where you hear us and you draw us out. So for those people, Lord, we carry in our hearts and we are concerned for, be with them during this day and bring them into new chapters of life. We're grateful for the open doors that we have, that the congregation that is Greendale People's Church continues in worship for another Sunday. Make this a Sunday, Lord, that stands out as one in which perhaps some of us have turned a corner, where we have heard your name and we rely on your goodness in new and fresh ways. And newness comes about in our lives and in our congregation. Make this a time where you send your spirit among us. And now bring our voices together as one as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The second scripture reading comes from the prophet Ezekiel. It will be the passage that I'll preach from during my sermon. A lot of um, imagery that may be a bit confusing. So I want you to tune your ear to how many times you hear about the Sovereign Lord, the Lord God, the Lord. The name of the Lord keeps coming up again and again. So for all the imagery about dry bones and the winds and everything else, remember fundamentally this is a passage where God speaks God's name and says where God speaks and where God is, new life comes about. And Sherry will read that now from the prophet Ezekiel. The second reading is Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. 
He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the saved sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. As I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, tendons of flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy son of man, say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he was commanded me, and breathe entered them, breath entered them. And they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone and we are cut off. Therefore, prophecy, and I say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. You heard it, didn't you? Then you will know that I am the Lord. The name of the Lord. It doesn't go without mention because the Lord takes the Lord's name seriously. In Hebrew, it is pronounced Yahweh. And the name is taken so seriously by Jews even to this day that they will not say Yahweh. The name is too holy and sacred. So they say the Lord. In some cases, there's sort of a Greek version of it that is Jehovah. It is a name to be taken seriously. But above all, it means the Lord. It means that I'm not the Lord. I'm not in control. Nor are you or anyone else. There is one who is, and the name is the Lord. Modern people of our time will know that there is a mysterious force at work. They will talk about it in all kinds of different words and different terms, but somehow it just is too much for people to say the Lord. Why? Because to say the Lord puts a person in a subservient position. That person is not the center of the universe. There is only one, and it is the Lord. That's too much for most people's ego and pride. But it is important to God. You know, they say nowadays that people are eager, eager to serve the Lord, but only in an advisory capacity. Okay, somebody got it. My wife, my wife tells me, Doug, you don't know how to tell jokes. Your timing is bad. Don't bother. <laughs> so, all right, somebody got it. Thank you very much. People want to be their own Lord. Hmm. But that first passage that Sherry read that summarizes what Pentecost Day is about is everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And people of our day say, I would rather die. Hmm. So I'm not focused as much in this sermon about the tongues of fire, about all of those spectacular languages that were spoken. And by the way, Sherry, you pronounced all those names very well. We are, we are pleased with that. The main thing had to do with the name of the Lord. 
The second passage, yeah, we want to know about those dry bones and what all of that means, but fundamentally what that passage was about is God is going to do something spectacular to people who are so down and out, knocked down on the canvas for the ten count, and God raises the dead and brings new life. Why? So that the name of the Lord will be mentioned throughout the world. The Lord does it for the name of the Lord. It's important, the name of the Lord. There's a guy in a church that I served who was in the 12-step movement. Uh, he attended AA and NA, and he came into the church and really started to come alive in the process. And he had this habit of always talking about, I have, I have received my sobriety and sanity from my higher power, whom I choose to call God. And he kept saying it, my power, who I choose to call God. I say, I told him, Chuck, you're in church. You don't have to use that kind of terminology. Why don't you try this? I was saved by the Lord, whom in other settings I refer to as my higher power. In other words, use the name. It was God who saved you. Don't tiptoe around it. Don't walk on eggshells. It's not offensive here in church. It may be out there in the world, but here we say the name of the Lord because it is by the grace of the Lord that we are who we are. Say the name, for goodness sake. It's like when the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And the Lord says to Moses out there in the desert, I am going to send you to the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, and you are going to tell that man in Egypt, Pharaoh, who is holding my people in slavery, you're going to say, the Lord says, let my people go. And Pharaoh is probably going to snicker at you because Pharaoh thinks he is the Lord. But make sure you make it perfectly clear that Yahweh is his name, and he is the Lord Pharaoh, and you're not. And the Lord goes into the valley where people are, where they feel hopeless, and the name of the Lord, the name Yahweh, the name Jehovah, is synonymous with that power that lifts us out of the valley when we think we have no hope. When our lives and our very being feels like dry bones, brittle and falling apart, it is there when we are out of our own resources that the name Yahweh, the name the Lord, enters in and brings new life. That's what the name of the Lord is synonymous with. Not about a higher power whom one chooses to call God. No, say the name for goodness sakes. I know that's too hard for people in our day. But the Lord takes the Lord's name seriously. And on my watch, I'm going to also. If you're watching the news these days, you will see uh, the movement that's taking place. It's called Say Her Name. And it is a way of speaking to those in power who have tried to dismiss, disregard, and deliberately forget people who have suffered unjustly and, and have been, in some cases, mistreated, in other cases, killed. It's saying, say her name, the name of the person who has suffered mightily, because her story will not be disregarded and forgotten. Say the name you want to disregard, you want to, to, to erase the memory of this person. But say the name, because the name and the story come to life, and we realize that there's still justice that we need to bring about in this world. Say the name, is what they are saying. For the memory of that person will not be wiped from the face of the earth. Say the name, the Lord is what our passage is saying today. Don't disregard it and let it fade away from memory on the face of the earth. Someone will have to uphold it. And God speaks to Ezekiel. And the gist of that entire book of Ezekiel, 48 chapters long, is God's, the Lord's concern for the Lord's name. The Lord speaks to Ezekiel and says, you know, it's not for the sake of the people of Israel so much that I am about to act mightily. I'm doing it 
for the sake of my holy name that has been trashed and trampled and disregarded throughout the world. I am about to raise a nation of people who have been forgotten by the world so that when these people come back to life, the nation of Israel, everyone will know that I am the Lord. I will vindicate my holy name. Ten times in that passage, the Lord keeps saying that. Say the name of the Lord. No more of this nebulous spirituality. The name of the Lord, because the Lord takes the Lord's name seriously. And the Lord's name means salvation and rescue from the pit. The name of Jesus was important. When the angel appeared to Mary, you will name him Jesus. Yeshua in Hebrew, which means Yahweh saves. The name is important. Make sure you, put, you give this child that name because that is what the Lord is going to do through this child. The Lord takes the Lord's name seriously. And when wonders occur, there will be no mistake that it was the Lord who made this happen. And so that's what our passage is about today. But unfortunately, people disregard the name of the Lord in our day and they look upon us as simpletons, ignorant of our own experience of the Lord. I want to show you something. It's one of the things I've learned this year in my continuing education. I love it because, because you're going to all understand what I'm talking about by the time I'm done with this, because you've gone through it yourself, or you've seen me. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning and Kruger are a couple of social psychologists. One at the University of Michigan, one at New York University. And they did all of this research about how they, they, they wanted to, to kind of test their, their, their hypothesis, which is, isn't it interesting that the people who know the least seem to be most sure of themselves? They don't know that they don't know, but they're so sure of themselves. So they decided to test this. And their research proved their hypothesis. And it kind of works like this. Uh, here I'm going I'm to measure the confidence, the person's confidence. Here's going to be experience. And so we're going to start on day one. Someone decides, I'm going to read a book. So they read a book. And when they finish this book, their confidence soars and they're way up here. Very little experience for one book, but now they know it all and they're going to let everybody know that they know it all. It's kind of like the guy who's told, you know, you're not, probably not going to catch any fish in this lake. Um, because we've been fishing this lake for 10 years and we hardly ever catch any fish. Rose is lying out the first time catches a big fish and says, hey, this is easy. A little bit of experience, now he's got a whole lot of time. The world is filled with all of those people. But here's the interesting thing that Dunning and Kruger discovered in their research. The more experience a person has, the less confidence they have in themselves. The more experience that says, you know, you're not so smart after all. You know, there's, uh, if you consider a different option, uh, have you read this other book as well? And they reach a point where, after more and more experiences, they hit sort of the bottom. And they'll say, I am never going to understand this. I will never get it. And they discovered that is the critical moment. Because it is from that point on that they will start to learn now as wise people and humble people. And they'll have more experiences and their confidence will begin to climb once again. And years later, they may have the same confidence they had after day one, but it's a whole different kind of confidence and a whole different kind of wisdom. And it all came about because of this time down here. They call this, right here, that very first experience, Mount Stupid. <laughs> oh, I know it all. They call this down here the 
valley of despair, I'm never going to get it. But it is here when things begin to change and they go up on the upward trajectory toward wisdom. And I have a feeling that this is what's going on in our day. People have a little bit of experience with the Lord or with religion or church or whatever, and they got it all figured out. Well, you know, I saw a 30-minute documentary on NBC News about those Christians. So, you know, I know it all. And then they start to have experiences with real-life people and say, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was. They eventually reach the point down here. I think a lot of people who are so sure that we don't need to talk about the Lord anymore are still standing on Mount Stupid. They think they're the king of the hill, when in fact maybe after a little bit more experience and maybe hearing a little bit different perspective, they'll begin to be a little less sure of themselves, eventually finding themselves down here. And as I've been saying all morning, it's in the valley, it's in the tomb, it's in the grave where Yahweh has shown Yahweh to be powerful throughout the scripture, from one end of the Bible to the other. The name of the Lord is suddenly called, and one comes to wisdom. But as long as some are so sure of themselves, relying on their own resources, the Lord can't do a whole lot, because that person is still their own Lord. Once they hit down here, it's like, I need help. And that's when things begin to change. You know, I was asked when I pastored a church in Lexington by a person, person I was working with in, in local ecumenical things. She was the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church. And she found me interesting and fascinating because I was not what she imagined a Christian to be. I was serving an evangelical church at the time. You, you, you're, you're, you're surprising me. This, this is not what I expected. So she asked me to speak a sermon at their Sunday morning gathering of that church. And so I did. And I came with both barrels blasting, and I gave it everything I had. Because you know what? I'm crazy enough to believe all of this kind of stuff. And at the end of it, what they typically did in that church is they had what they kind of called after-sermon conversation at coffee hour, and usually about two or three people attended with the preacher, and they talked about the sermon, usually for five minutes. On that morning, almost 50 people gathered, and we talked for a full hour, and they were absolutely mesmerized and shocked. They said, you are not what we expected. It turns out you're not the Neanderthal we thought you were going to be. You're more articulate than we thought. You have this passion that we haven't seen before. You have completely upset our understanding of what we thought a Christian was. And maybe by the end of that one hour coffee hour, they were a little bit closer to down here realizing, I'm not so clever after all. Maybe I have a lot to learn. And maybe I knocked them off the peak of Mount Stupid. I don't know. But it was once again a display of how the world works and how in this valley of despair, when you hit the bottom, the things can finally start to bounce back up. And so, and so it's a long, long introduction, introduction to the to valley, valley of dry bones, bones, bones in Ezekiel 37, 37 where, where the Lord speaks to the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a member and a priest and a prophet of the nation Israel. And the nation Israel had just been completely destroyed and dismantled by the Babylonian army. They had lost everything. Ezekiel had even just lost his own wife. He himself was here in this valley of despair. He had hit rock bottom. The whole nation had been deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. They were as good as dead. And it was represented by dry, brittle bones. How can you bring dry, brittle bones back to life? And it's there that the Lord speaks to Ezekiel in the valley. And things begin to change. Because Yahweh is the one who speaks to people and raises people from the valley and brings them back up. It was the name of the Lord that was in the tomb with Jesus when he was there that raised him up. It is, it is here, here where God begins to do God's work. Have you ever felt like you're in the valley? Have you reached the point of 
depleting your own resources. That's when the name of the Lord comes and the Lord can speak and things can begin to change for you. In that movie, Out of Africa, that was about 30-some years old now, Robert Redford and Meryl Streep were characters in it. And Rob, the Robert Redford character says to her about some tribe in Africa, this tribe, um, when they are put in prison, they die. And the Meryl Streep character says, well, why is that? He says to her, they have no concept of the future that one day they will be let out. So in other words, when they go into the valley, into the grave, into the prison, they see no hope. There's no way out. And so eventually their bodies fall apart and they die. they die. And I get to wonder, what about the name of the Lord? Do they know that they can call on the name of the Lord? Israel felt as though they were done. But it is there in the valley of dry bones that the Lord appears. And the Lord says to Ezekiel, I will raise you out of your graves. Then everyone will know that I am the Lord. That's the way it works with the Lord. Yahweh is the name of the Lord. When I pastored a church... You know, this is probably 15 years ago. At the time, there was this clever saying that the kids would often use. No way, Yahweh. And basically what that meant is when you feel as though there's no way, way out of this, there's, there's no, no way anything good is going to come to that. The reply to that is Yahweh. There is, there is something new. There is a way. There is not just that way that leads further down into the valley. There's a way. And the Lord puts that on display throughout the Bible from place to place. So if you're at a point here today where you're saying, there's no way for me, I'm here to say, Yahweh. <laughs> for this is the name of the Lord, and the Lord speaks to people where they think there is no way. But somehow, but somehow people don't like to t mention that name. Don't say anything about the Lord. But nevertheless, even though the Lord goes anonymous in our world, the Lord is still at work. And people are seeing that and experiencing that in this world today. There's a group of business consultants and organizational gurus at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And they have come up with this theory they have of how to re regenerate and revitalize people in congregations. And here it is. Theory you. Don't, don't talk about the Lord. Don't mention Yahweh. Don't say anything about Jehovah. But well, one thing we have experienced in all of our education to become MIT professors, in all of our experiences with organizations and people out in the world, we have discovered this really interesting thing that seems to take place. And we call it Theory U. And basically it's this. People will come at a certain point in time, Greendale People's Church, for example, and they say, you know, we really need to turn over a new lease. We need a whole new lease on life. We need to be a new congregation. And typically what they think they can do is, oh, well, let's just do this, that, and the other, and we'll just go across and everything will be just fine. They said, no, that's not the way it works. The only way to get over here is to go down, deep down first. And they discovered this interesting thing. The more people let go of all the things that they were holding on to that constituted their sense of security and what they were about, the more they let go, the more they finally hit the bottom. And they found here in this, these are MIT people, Way down in the valley, there's something mysterious and wonderful that is experienced that they call presence. When people have let go enough, they can suddenly experience this presence, presence that is with them. They call it almost, almost the power of the universe comes to their aid. Don't say the Lord. Say the power of the universe 
comes to their aid. And now they can finally begin to let the future come. Because they have let go of everything. Now isn't that interesting? Sure sounds a lot like what Ezekiel was talking about 2,600 years ago. Only he referred to the Lord down here rather than present. This kind of thing is confirmed in our world, but people don't want to say the name of the Lord. So I'm saying it to you today. You often have to let go and go down from the peak of Mount Stupid down into the valley before things can get better. And they proved it at MIT, MIT themselves. Sounds a lot like what happened to Ezekiel, where Yahweh met him in the valley of dry bones and said, we can start to make things new because you finally let go enough to let come the grace of God and the power of the Lord. Hmm. People don't want to say it, though. So I'm here to say it today. It's kind of like the hoity-toity woman, you know, the upper crust woman who said, I don't sweat. I perspire. Yeah. I mean, it's terminology. It's the Lord who's there, not the higher power that I choose to call something or other. It is the Lord who was there in the valley, for goodness sake. Kind of like it's too gauche to say the Lord. Just like if I speak in Latin, I sound smarter than if I speak in English. So I say something in Latin like Aquila non capit muscus, which in English means an eagle doesn't catch flies. An eagle's above catching flies, in other words. And so for them, it's Aquila non capit muscus. We're above saying the Lord. Oh no, I'm not so sure you are. Because eventually people will call on the name of the Lord and the name of the Lord will be known because that's what God has promised to us. So whether you are at MIT, and even if the name is not said, that doesn't mean that the Lord is not at work anonymously. Why not say the name of the Lord? One thing people do experience in our day, though, is not so much presence as absence. No, that's the one thing about human beings, whether it was in Ezekiel's time, 2,000 years before Ezekiel, or 2,600 years later, the human being has this odd capacity to always feel as though things just aren't completely right. Pascal, who was a great philosopher in France about three or four hundred years ago, referred to this sort of as the God-shaped vacuum that people have. He said he's noticed this interesting thing. Once people have been satisfied Despite to a certain extent, they've been fed, they've been clothed, and they've been housed, you'd think they would be content. But that is often when they experience even more acutely that something's just not right. Something is missing. And he says it is this infinite desire that people have to finally set things right. And he referred to it as the abyss. It's kind of like this deep bottomless pit, infinite pit of a hole that people have. And they try to fill it in order to finally be satisfied. They fill it with things. They fill it with exciting experiences. They think things and all these things are going to fill up this infinite bottomless pit. And Pascal says, the only thing that can fill up an infinite hole is an infinite being, and that is the Lord. That's what the people are looking for. You know, people don't know it. People need to be told what you're looking for is the spirit of the Lord. Say the name. And in your abyss, the only way to fill it is with something infinite, and the infinite is God. People, People are like that. that. I once saw a cartoon where, uh, just a, a one picture cartoon, cartoon. where there where was a man in his real life suit walking, walking, walking down the sidewalk. Obviously, Obviously the CEO of the company. And then and next, next to him, him on the side of the sidewalk was a hard hard man. Man. kind of a laborer, a common, common laborer. laborer. And they showed kind of this little, this little cloud above each of them of what they were thinking. The CEO looks at the other guy and says, I wish I were him, because then I would have no stress. 
The other man's looking up at the CEO and says, I wish I were him, because then I would finally feel rich. And that cartoon kind of captures this gap that people are feeling. They want to fill it with something. They're looking for all kinds of things to fill it. The only thing that can is the infinite, and that is the spirit of the Lord. People, people have that, they discover a whole new power to life. It's kind of like prior to that. the name of the Lord and fill that infinite abyss with the infinite God. And so finally, the Lord says, I will put my spirit in you. And when my spirit is in you, you will experience a strength you had not experienced before. And I got to thinking about this. Now, is there anywhere in our world today that that could be confirmed? where somebody is experiencing that power, that presence that they have, that they just don't say is the Lord? I was thinking, and it came to me. I had read a book about two years ago. Now this was a professor from Harvard who wrote a book called Presence, Bringing Your Boldest Self to Your Biggest Challenges. I'm thinking, now isn't this interesting? Well, that And so the book basically says, I can save you a lot of time and a lot of money. It basically says this, before you are about to go into some challenging situation, pose and imagine yourself to be Superman or Superwoman for a while. And as you do that, you will begin to actually believe that you are Superman or Superwoman. And then you will enter into this challenging situation and you will exude this presence, this power. And the writer admits it may only last as long as that meeting, and then you'll go back to feeling weak, but it worked while it mattered. Presence, power, projecting it to the world. 3,000 years ago, the Lord said to Ezekiel, I will put my spirit in you, and you will exude a presence and a power. And it won't go away at the end of the meeting, for it will endure forever. I think finally, as I'm concluding my sermon, about that character from the Bible, Gideon. Yeah, the, 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 they got that, the people with the Bibles that put in, in, in hotels, they got it from, from him. Gideon in the Bible. Gideon was chosen by the Lord, specifically called the Lord, to rescue the Israelites, who were, you guessed it, in the valley at the time, being beaten up by one nation after another. And the Lord says to Gideon, I want you to raise an army to defend Israel against all of these attackers. And Gideon says to the Lord, The Lord, I am from the weakest clan in all of Israel. And on top of that, I'm the weakest and least of the weakest and least clan. You don't want to choose me. And the Lord says, I will put my spirit on you. And literally in Hebrew it says, I will send my spirit and I will clothe my spirit with you. <laughs> you will be the clothes of the spirit in this world. And you will raise up an army and you will defend all of Israel. People will come to your aid and listen to your command because you will exude a presence. And it won't be your presence Though it will be your face, it will be the presence of my spirit that I will put upon you. 
And the Israelites went out into battle and they defeated their enemies. And their slogan was, we're doing this for the Lord and for Gideon. They were mentioning the name and it all came because a man had the spirit of the Lord and he had that presence. The lowest, the least, and the Lord. And things began to go back up for them. So, to cut a long story short, don't be few, fooled by the 21st century refusal to say the name of the Lord. The Lord, I promise you, is operating in spite of being considered anonymous. But I welcome you to join me and to join everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, for the Lord will save us. Amen. Though we're all sitting in the same room, we may each be in a different location spiritually. I hope nobody's standing on the peak of Mount Stupid today. 
If you find yourself in the valley, that's where the Lord is and the Lord raises you. Don't be like the tribe that thinks there is no future. There is, and that's what the Lord is all about. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Enjoy it in the power of the Lord.